I'm sure some folks will still participate in politics, hoping they can find a benevolent ruler to at least mitigate uh, some of the infringements in place now. But guys, that's, that's, that's a road to nowhere. It's a road to beatdowns on the street, extortion, and democide, with an even greater loss of freedom year after year, election after election. And it's, it's one of the most vicious falsehoods perpetuated throughout the ages. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, naive notion that politics can set you free. Uh, and that's why I've been so harsh on the anti-libertarian libertarian party, uh, because, uh, as I've said before, the people are sick of politics, the left-right paradigm. So what do they do? They give them more politics. It's, uh, it's the most uh, uh, insincere and ingenuine thing you can do to a fellow human being. It really is dangerous to be an anarchist, and it, it will only get, I mean, it, you know, as per kind of the, the stages of Agoras and that Konkin kind of laid out, it, it's, it's going to get worse, and then it's going to get better, but, you know, when, when's it, when's it going to start getting better? You're listening to Liberty Under Attack Radio, and now your host, Shane. And welcome to Liberty Under Attack Radio, your home for anarchism in action. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the communist state of Illinois. This podcast, everything found on the website, unless otherwise noted, is covered by a BIPCOT's no government license, as well as reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the bludgies thereof. You can learn more at BIPCOT.org. So I'd like to welcome Kyle Reardon from the Alaska Steel blog as we dive into episode 7 of our Building the Second Realm series. I know I've said this every week, but if you haven't caught the other episodes, you really, really need to. Uh, this is a series, and we will be uh, building upon previously discussed concepts uh, and ideas. I hope you enjoyed the two substitute episodes uh, over the past two weeks. Uh, the first was my interview with the terrific crypto anarchist Paul Rosenberg, and the second was the audiobook for Roger Roots' Our Cops Constitutional, uh, narrated by yours truly. I figured it would serve as a nice look into a first realm institution, I figured, and I wanted to tie it into the series somehow, so I think I did that uh, all right, all right, I suppose. So today we'll, we'll be talking about permanent and temporary autonomous zones, as well as a brief discussion and introduction to the gentleman that formulated the concepts, uh, Hakeem Bay. So Kyle, welcome back to the Brander Attack Radio, sir. It's a pleasure to, to, to be with you. Uh, what's new? How are things going? Uh, well, I well I guess maybe the uh, the first thing I'll mention is that I'm I'm really sick of the servile society that that first realm um, because even when it comes to trying to make a livelihood, uh, their timing their timing sucks and not in a good way. Um, in terms of oh hey we like to extend you a job offer, but in order to do that you might actually have to and will have to break a contract with with another employer. And I'm not big on breaking contracts, so <laughs> at this point I'm just kind of waiting for the uh, the job offer formally that's supposed to come in my email. Yeah, that sounds really official, doesn't it? And uh, <laughs> and basically just trying to kind of see if the number is high enough that where I can be bought off in order to break my contracts and all that. I have a sneaking suspicion, though, that it, the, the amount is not going to be high enough for me to break my contract, as well as the fact that even if it were, I would probably not want to do it anyway, um, because they've been stringing me along for like four months now in different stages and different things. And I would have to use my precious break time to uh, basically like write essays about how much I want this job and all this kind of stuff or my previous <laughs> experience. That was during the first round and then that's during bad, the second dude. round. That's, yeah, was, for, yeah, that's more oh, than you told me last night. That's awful. <laughs> oh, oh, it's bad. And um, the, you aren't getting paid for that. No, it's on my personal time. And it's worse because now I have to fit it in my break time while I'm on duty, you know, basically working at a warehouse, uh, which is even worse because, of course, they always try to uh, make sure that um, – uh, things are convenient for them, not me, and and so forth. So I'm like trying to busily like scribble notes on the back of an envelope, in terms of even just a draft version of an email. While I'm, you know, have my my precious 15 minutes. Ooh, 15 minutes. It's like barely mm -hmm. enough time to, um, you know, scratch your butt, pick your nose, and uh, you know, maybe puke a bit uh, in your mouth. I don't know. Um, but that that's that's just kind of where it's at. And so I'm I'm considering turning it down, even though it's it's full time because. You know, I, I have I have three other jobs, and the only reason for that is I'm I'm kind of experimenting. To be fair, 
uh, with uh, trying to achieve financial independence and, and preferably retire earlier rather than not. Uh, current goal is to see maybe if I can retire by either uh, 40 or 45 at the latest, uh, because quite frankly, I don't want to spend the rest of my life making other people wealthier. Yeah, yeah, I definitely know what you mean. I definitely know what you mean. But that's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's. I guess it's, it's always good to have options. I, I suppose. But uh, I'm sorry, they're, uh, they're jerking around a little bit. Yeah, I'd imagine, uh, from, from what, from what you've told me, yeah, I, I doubt it's, uh, it's gonna be worth it. I highly doubt it. I feel like it. I feel like they're just terrible employers. Yeah, I, I agree. And the only, the only real issue is. It would have been one thing if I went from, uh, for one of my employers, if I went from a part-time to full-time and it was just a replacement with, that That would basically be not just a promotion but also a raise. But it's not like that at all. Because they took so long, I already made other commitments contractually for work because they just left me hanging and it's like two months later and it's like, you know, I've got a temp gig now and I have to, you know, abide by that contract, at least I would like to. Uh, because that's 14 an hour, and um, and it was it was funny because uh, yesterday uh, the issue kind of came down with um, I had to push and push and push and push when I actually went in for my third interview, third interview, and actually I was asking, okay, um, yeah, I have two questions, you know, I'm going to open up the floor to you. I'm like, okay, cool, I got lots of questions, and I asked a bunch of questions just about other things that I hadn't got straight answers on yet during the first two interviews, and I got those, and that was good, and then I was basically, then I basically asked, what are the shifts? And you'll love this, morning shift, 4 a.m. to 1.30 p.m., afternoon shift, 1 p.m. to 9.30 p.m., that's the evening. This does the evening. <laughs> this does not mesh with my wow. three other one with my with the timing of of the three other ones where, with with the one with the with the one job I'm trying to replace, it's done in five hour shifts. So that there and it's flex scheduling, which is really a blessing more than not. Even though sometimes it's kind of irritating just to get hours. And then of course um, the hotel is basically just on the weekends, but it's eight hour shifts. And then of course the temp gigs, when I do have one, are normal business hours, Monday through Friday, more or less nine to five. Uh, technically, it's more like eight to four thirty. But you know, you know who's looking at it. And of course, if you get to telecommute, like I've been very blessed with uh, the last two projects, then I don't even have to deal with rush hour, which is really a blessing more than not. Because do I do I look like the guy who really wants to get stuck in you know downtown Austin traffic, um, you know for for over an hour? Uh, no, not this guy. Sorry, I'd like to actually make my car last longer. So that that's let me, just so kind let of me let me ask you a question about that. Then you said you're telecommuting. Um, do you ever have to go into an office or anything for that job, or could that be a location independent position? I'm trying to make it location independent via telecommuting. Mm, you see, like because it. when I first started, so the same time last year when I when I got the first gig, I had to go into the office. It was my first one. I don't know the business. I had to do it that way. There was no other way around it. And the next, what was it, two or three projects after that or thereabouts, I had to go into the office because that's what it was offered. The last project I was on was actually the first one they had offered me where it was telecommuting. And except for the nature and content of the specific thing that I was working on, except for that, everything else about it was fantastic because I got to wake up like five minutes before I was on duty kind of thing, you know, shuffle off, grab a cup of coffee and then sit down and, and, and do work. And it looks like this, this two month thing that's going to start in April and go through, I think June is, um, it is telecommuting. And so the problem is, and this is and this is a lesson about economics, folks, in terms of trade-offs. The choice that I'm right now f facing down the barrel of, and next week I'm supposed to get the official job offer, where they'll finally tell me what my base pay is, what the salary is, because I asked two different people yesterday, um, "What's uh, can I have? Like, can you like tell me a number so I can make a decision?" They're like, "Well, it'll be in the job offer." So they they completely yeah, that's super avoid. Strange. No shit. And remember, this is all white market stuff. So all these so all these little um, conniving uh, whatever status of various flavors who want everything taxed, regulated and licensed by the state. Well, this is a re this is one of the results of this kind of thing, because there was really only two things I really want to know. What are the shifts? What's the flexibility of the shifts? I.e., is it flex scheduling or fixed schedule? And then, of course, uh, what's the pay? 
because the first two interviews was all about the actual nature of the work, what my previous experience is. I mean, he even got into the whole, you know, hopes and dreams and also previous work experience in terms of tell me a time. I, you'll love this one. Tell me oh, a those time. Questions, yeah. Oh, oh, it gets better. My favorite one was, tell me a time when you uh, when you dealt with a complex problem by using a simple solution. Christ. Yeah, and it's just like, I already did this twice before. Why am I doing this a third time? And actually, to be perfectly honest, when I got the call back from the recruiter, not the person, not the interviewer that I did the third interview with, but the recruiter who who, who contacted me later, I actually got... I actually got kind of, you know, persnickety because we're at the tail end of this. She mentioned that they want to extend me an offer, which means I passed. The third interview is what that means. And for once, I actually honestly didn't want to because it, cause there was – because I was already leaning – because after that third interview, I just felt like shit. I just said – they already told me once before after the second interview months ago that, you know, thanks for playing, kid, but no dice. And that was because of that that I then went to go get the hotel job and, you know, then got the uh, another temp gig and all that. So I moved on because they told me no. And then three weeks ago, it's, oh, by the way, the same exact position's available. It's just like, oh, they – I'm sorry. Time is money. Time is money. And, yeah, you know, yeah, what I do they expect me to do? Just languish and, you know, basically like, you know, just be a hermit at that warehouse with all of its 20 million awful problems, especially within the past three, uh, you know, two and a half, three weeks. I mean, come on. This this is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. And it's another reason I don't like corporate America and 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 so forth and all of the little I mean, it's almost as bad It's it's getting to the degree of almost being as bad as like the corporate fascism. Uh, like vis-a-vis -vis, like this different major league sports leagues where they get, where they demand uh, subsidies from the government to build their like you know uh, stadiums and such because you know sports is the opiate of the masses and so such. Um, it's 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 getting to be kind of like that, unfortunately. Hmm. And 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 I'm and I'm done with it. I'm done with it. I don't want to work for a corporation that is currently to give a little hint to the listeners that is basically trying to set up a second headquarters and there are various municipal governments that are vying to try and be the site for this second headquarters right like, yeah they're, they're saying I mean, well you'll you get a bunch of tax breaks all, yeah, all this stuff yeah i know what you mean yeah, i mean, it's, it's, I mean it's, paralleling, it's paralleling walmart it's paralleling walmart when 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 walmart would get subsidies from different municipal governments to set up a location in some you know Backshit watering hole, uh, whether it's tax breaks or something else, and it's like, look, that's that's real fascism. That's corporatism. There's nothing free market about any of that. And you know, I'm I'm just I'm I'm pretty much at the end of my rope. And the funniest part is my other two employers. Yeah, they're maybe a little, you know, one of them I'm still pretty much the new guy, still learning the ropes, and then the other one, I did try to go for a full time thing like once, and I was told no. And then I went back to the temp gigs, and I've been fine since. And actually, it's gotten better because now I can telecommute. So you know, there's a little bit of a of a back and forth to some degree. But my but generally speaking, my other two employers have been pretty good to me. All all things considered, all things considered, it's right. really just this one that is the bane of my goddamn existence. They penalize entrepreneurial initiative. I even got – I was even threatened with a formal disciplinary thing if I actually tried, you know, actually um, doing a roundabout method of actually managing the inventory because there was actually another way to do it. And it was like – and I was even – it was like you were – you literally – this is what one of the assistant managers said. You have, have cost this company 52 minutes in uh, profits. Don't – and if you do it again, you'll get a verbal warning and it will go in your personnel file. That was last week. Yeah, first, uh, yeah, the the employment of the first realm is obviously uh, obviously shitty, uh, except for the the financial independence pass that we discussed on uh, the episode of Vani that we recorded last night. So, <clears throat> so yeah, first realm employment sucks. It really does. It really does. I'm I'm just I'm in a I'm in a lucky I'm in a pretty lucky position myself, um, but you know most of it is just uh, is pretty awful. And I and so yes, if there was ever a reason for permanent and or temporary autonomous zones, it's so that. Those individuals who don't want to be subjected to this pretty awful treatment that I've received, uh, or worse, or worse to be fair, uh, pretty much any of us can kind of get away from that kind of stuff and actually have our liberty respected instead of being treated as if any one of us is basically like an irresponsible little brat who's also stupid. 
because that's right. I mean that's where I'm at. So yeah, yeah, I got you, I got you. I guess there's just one thing on my end, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm actually uh, about to uh, you know hopefully in the very near future uh, move into my own temporary autonomous zone called a a van, a converted van that I'm gonna live aboard. So uh, I went uh, yeah, it was a couple nights ago. I went out and uh, did a, a practice uh, van life run. So I uh, put out the video for that. It's at uh, youtube.com forward slash liberty under attack for, uh, for the YouTubes. Or you can go to uh, uh, go to DTube, which is the uh, the Steemit alternative to YouTube. Uh, so you can you know, upvote that and, and you know uh, help me get paid. It's at tinyurl.com forward slash rayo123. Again, tinyurl.com forward slash rayo123. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's that's happening. That's happening. So it's uh, pretty pretty exciting. I think I've talked about that uh on uh the you know, on lua yet i don't think i have but uh actually i did just upload the video to uh to facebook the uh the lua facebook page so you can find it there as well uh so yeah that's that's i don't know pretty exciting man yes and i i'm i'm very happy for you uh you're definitely farther along than i am so i'll definitely keep a, a close eye and i'm sure you'll give me all the like the juicy details off air so to speak as as far as like uh, certain things you're trying out but um yeah I, I i think i think at this point i'm pretty much gonna develop urban vanu to the degree that i can and we'll kind of see how that goes but I think I think what you're doing where you're actually kind of documenting your experiences, you know, getting closer to van nomadism, I think I think is pretty awesome. So, yeah, um, kind of like I mentioned in the other episode, make sure uh, gym membership thing place to, you know, basically mm -hmm. take care of your hygiene, your blackout curtains. And then, of course, either a mobile hotspot and or find out where the Wi-Fi spots are at. And um, yeah, I mean, otherwise you can pretty much find food and water pretty much just about anywhere. So that's not so much of an issue, uh, all things considered. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's uh... – oh, and by the way, if – sorry, I, I forgot to say this in the other episode. I'll say it here. If, 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 God forbid, Bob forbid, excuse me, Bob forbid, if um, – if the bludgies happen to go knock, knock, knock at like your uh, thing at three in the morning or whatever, yeah. uh, maybe maybe you should consider uh, either filming it and or maybe we're doing a write up the next day and and kind of sharing with everybody just exactly what the encounters were because I know there's been some uh, van dwellers, van nomads that will be occasionally harassed by the bludgies, but it won't be anything like a police brutality type thing. It'll be more just, hey, wake up, you bum, move on type of thing. Kind of like just how, kind of like how they harass homeless people who are like sleeping on a bench in a right. park yeah, in the middle of the night. Yeah, they don't, uh, yeah, the first realm doesn't like uh, so-called homeless people, even if it's by choice. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you're exactly right. Uh, what The vein I'm going to get, uh, it's going to be kind of like a Chevy Express 1500 or 2500 or kind of like a, a Ford e E350, kind of those with those work vans. Uh, and then you just uh, you, you convert them. So what I'll probably do if I if I ever get in a position where I could run into the blood to the bludgies, I'll be stealth camping. Uh, so it'll just like an, uh, it'll just it'll just look like a normal work truck, you know, just very inconspicuous. Good deal. Uh, so good that's, deal. So that's so that's good. But ge but generally speaking, I mean, I plan on you know going out to the desert, you know, going out to the beach for like a week at a time, because uh, my van will be off grid. So um, that'll be that'll be good. So I mean, I I shouldn't have very much. I shouldn't have really any opportunities for interaction with the bludgies. Well, yeah, I mean, if you choose your spots right and, and so forth, yes, then then that should be not as much of an issue. It's really more if you're like in like the Walmart parking lot or if not necessarily that example, if you're in some like um, – uh, oh God! What did Rayo call it? Like urban, like um, it's like the urban version of van nomadism, but with city squat spots. Mm -hmm. At that point, yeah, you, you kind of have to be careful with with certain areas and all that, and that's very much case by case basis. So, but yeah, I I, I definitely wish you well, and and you know definitely uh definitely keep me up to date about that because uh you know I can I can learn from both your successes and your failures you know as a friendly third party here so to speak so oh yeah I'll I'll document a lot of shit yeah I'll, I'll start doing when I get on the road I'll do daily or weekly vlogs or something like that so yeah I'll document anything interesting because good deal good deal yeah it'll be one one route for financial independence and um and also uh it'll just be a really really cool experience so well, yeah. So you're kind of you're kind of uh, getting two birds stoned, right? Uh, the uh, two birds stoned yeah, at once, yeah. Right. I mean, you're basically cutting your expenses so deep that you don't even have rent at that point. Um, I mean, you might have to spend a little bit, some more in gas just because you have to move around. But then I, I think that's kind of negligible, really. And so if it's like, oh, I have to spend, let's say hypothetically, if you had to spend five dollars more in gas, but then you save several hundred dollars or more in rent, the savings are still a fantastic 
fantastic savings. It's it's really it's right, it's, right. Yeah. And especially like in the West Coast, like you know, I may you know drive three or four hours to choose a different spot, but you know, I'll probably be in most places, you know, multiple days. Uh -huh. uh, so you know, if you keep your travel down, uh, that helps sub substantially too. There was one guy who drove his van from uh, the East Coast to the West Coast, like New York to uh, like San Diego or something. He said he spent like 600 bucks in gas to go across. So if you just travel, you know, little portions of like the, the West or the Pacific Northwest, uh, I mean, that's, yeah, negligible gas costs. I mean, yeah, that is kind of the, one of that's one of the major expenses. But when you compare it to, you know, a monthly rent or something like that uh, or mortgage, it's nothing. Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, there are some people who uh, like to obfuscate that issue. And it's like, wow, did they not sit down with a calculator and actually like add, subtract, yeah. multiply, and divide? Uh, they must have gone to uh, uh, to government schools for their math classes. Well, geez, if that's the case, then they shouldn't do my hotel job at all because, like, at least half of what I'm doing is math at three in the morning. In fact, that's kind of what I'm I'm going to be doing pretty much after we finish this episode. So, um, but oh, yeah, yeah I, well, yeah, and if I don't do my my math, you know, correctly, I mean, that's uh, that's not good job performance, and that would be a legitimate issue because I have to like balance the books and look at you know um, detailed receivables and 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 such things. Uh, look at uh, whether the company profited by telephone calls, which, by the way, as a side note, no, they don't generally speaking, um, and, and some other things. So, uh, yes, doing math, depending on the nature of the work, can actually be very important and actually kind of keep you afloat. Uh, besides, of course, even if you got a form of work that didn't have you doing math at 3 in the morning, uh, you still need to do it for, like, budgeting reasons and, and trying to uh, retire early so you're not spending – the remaining of your life making corporations and even to some extent even the state wealthier right through the the tax uh the, through the tax yes, system and such yes exactly because as a van nomad if it, um, obviously you can you a lot, there are a lot of people that make more than this but um, the expenses are like five hundred dollars a month so um, that's pretty good and, and you know a lot of folks don't even you know have any like they they they, they uh, you know or they have some some sort of you know passive income and uh, they don't even work. And it's just, you know, like five hundred dollars a month. So yeah. if you're if you're underneath that threshold of like twenty two thousand dollars, then yeah, I mean you don't have to pay any taxes. I mean you'll still pay the uh, what are they, the excise taxes like gas mm -hmm. and stuff. Sure. So sure. they're still paying taxes, but the but the amount that they're the income taxes is where most of it comes from, right? So if you yeah, aren't giving it if you aren't giving the state that, then uh, there's uh, less money for them to work with. So I think that's another you know great benefit to uh, van nomadism. Well, and of course, and if folks wanted to kind of, you know, combine different methods and depending on uh, what uh, the certain laws of a certain municipality or ordinances or whatever, um, arguably, uh, whether it counts as civil disobedience or not, because again, Vanu is about uh, practicality, not legality. Uh, if you were to combine that with dumpster diving, um, depending on the availability of certain edibles that are still halfway decent condition, and that goes double and triple if the, well, if the weather is colder, kind of like how it is here in town and here in Austin, it's like in the 40s. Um, if you combine them with dumpster diving and you know how to do it at, you know, well and safely and all that, um, then pre pretty much that can kind of cut your cost down too. If you were to get over some of the, uh, you know, remember Rayo, he would constantly mention about the, uh, the cultural, uh, snobbery and bigotry, uh, that certain people have and all that. And I, when it comes to dumpster diving specifically, oh my God, it is really palpable. And people are on record saying like, how dare you do dumpster diving and all that? And there are certain people that haven't bought groceries in years because they know how to do it safely. And they know where like the good spots are. They know when the stuff gets thrown out, which is still actually for the most part in pretty good condition. And even when stuff is not in good condition, they know to avoid that. Like there's, I mean, there was even um, uh, that book called uh, The Art and Science of, of Dumpster Diving, which I wrote a book report on a long time ago. Is that so, a Loom, that's a Lumpanics book, isn't it? Yes, it is. Hell yeah. Uh, and, and so that actually that might be worth an episode all by itself, actually. Uh, um, but the, but my TVP, point is definitely yeah. But what I, what I'm trying to kind of get at here is that in terms of having like temporary autonomous zones, even um, if you were to combine certain methods like van nomadism with dumpster diving with or or whatever else, or even um, maybe some sort of like uh, urban farming type thing. Uh, I think Rayo mentioned too about like uh, like growing. Almost, it's kind of almost like a permaculture thing, sort of, but it's more clandestine. Yeah, I think what you wrote about crypto culture. Yeah, it's crypto. Hidden. Yeah, hidden. crypto. Yeah. Right, right. Crypto culture. Yeah. Um, if you were to combine certain methods, you can pretty much be not just off the grid, but out of sight and out of mind, which can actually, ironically, save you a lot of money. So even for people mm -hmm. who are allegedly conservatives, um, you would think they would try to conserve 
uh, a lot of things, whether that would be the environment or whether that would be their own pocketbook or whether it would be um, – they would hypothetically say traditional family values, whatever the hell that means. Um, but when it comes down to it, no, they would rather pay, 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 pay that income tax. They would rather support the military and the police and uh, propagate uh, the myth of the Muslim non-invasion and a couple other things. And so that that's just kind of unfortunately kind of where they're at. The conservatives are not about conserving in much the same way that the anti-liberal liberals are not very liberal or tolerant of much of anything because of course if you violate their safe spaces they they'll want to sick the bludges on you as well so uh that's that's authoritarianism for you in a nutshell i suppose <laughs> yeah so you want to talk about uh temporary i guess you want to talk about uh tazes and pazes I, I i think we've been kind of circling around that <laughs> right. so yes yes right. exactly. let's go ahead yes let's, let's go ahead and, and define our terms here so temporary autonomous zones tazes Geographically mobile areas wherein individuals can exercise their autonomy to the fullest outside of state control or servile society cultural influence. Uh, so those are tasses. Uh, you pay nomadism. That's, that's a bunch of different tasses. Um, freedom festivals. Those are temporary autonomous zones. They aren't there all the time. They're, uh, you know, the the attendants, the attendees of the festival only, uh, I guess, uh, exist in that space for just uh, for a weekend. So it's it's definitely a temporary autonomous zone. Well, and the key thing is is on temporary, right? It's it's mobile. It's, I mean, even some of the uh, the uh, agorist literature mentions uh, tazes, uh, whether it's what the, like yeah, you know, what the what the state can't what the Kate state can't find, they can't go worse. So. Exactly. So whether it's in the form of, uh, for example, like the novella hashtag agora, or it's uh, the nonfiction, uh, the second realm. Uh, you know, book on strategy and such. Um, you know, Taz's are are I personally think is pretty much where it's at, at least in in this time period. So, um, not saying it couldn't go into the direction of Paz's, which will be defined here shortly. I'm just simply saying that in terms of people doing direct action today, um, the barrier to entry is virtually non-existent. The only reason people don't do Taz's is because they're still stuck on uh, reformism and 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 playing games with. Um, uh, basically trying to force the state to be their own personal billy club and all that kind of stuff, which we've covered at length before in previous episodes. So that that's that's pretty much that. I mean, if people really wanted to have temporary autonomous zones, they would have done it already. Right, yeah, and, and th th some of them definitely do exist. They definitely do exist. So permanent autonomous zones, passes. Geographically fixed areas, such as intentional communities, permaculture farms, uh, etc., wherein individuals exercise their autonomy, yet run into the risk of state interference. Passes can serve as nodes for a TAS-based mobile community. So uh, there's a couple elements at play there, and I'll start with the last one. That uh, um, I've, I've kind of had this idea, and actually it wasn't my idea, it was Jamie Baconics. He said... Uh, he said one thing kind of missing, you know, that he saw in, in Rayo's, uh, in, in, I guess in Rayo's journey was, you know, there wasn't, he had to go back to the Cerebral Society for food and Jamin thinks that's kind of stupid. And I kind of agree with him, right? I, I, I kind of agree with him. So the idea that Jamin brought to me was, um, you know, pr different permaculture farms all over, say, the West or the Pacific Northwest, um, and then maybe into kind of the South, and then, you know, van nomads or uh, whatever type of nomads they are that are, you know, going to these uh, these passes, these they can, uh, you know, stop off. They can kind of, uh, you know, make the uh, make the journey, and they will always have uh, that uh, permaculture food. So uh, interesting, interesting stuff. Uh, so yeah, instead of uh, being temporary, they're definitely permanent. So that's the main difference between uh, tazes and passes. It's very self-explanatory. Temper? If are you are you existing in the space temporarily, or is it permanent? Um, and yeah, unfortunately, due to that fact, uh, you know, if there's uh, land purchased, you know, and so-called private property. Um, then yeah, uh, you have to pay, you have to pay property taxes. You'll open yourself up to coercion. So that's why for me, I prefer Taz's uh, over Paz's because with Paz's you run into uh, a lot more risk. Yeah, and there are certain people that like to talk about like private cities, and then and I, I know on previous episodes of I think both LUA and TVP, I think we've kind of gotten into uh, kind of looking at uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of private cities and 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 related similar things along those lines, um, you know, free ports and such. Um, I, I would like at this point to kind of maybe very very quickly go through the uh, Wikipedia list of examples of passes because just 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 to make this really concrete, because passes are easier to conceive of in. Some some sense where you're basically mobile. I mean, it's it's almost like basically being a gypsy would probably be the the of one way of conceiving of it. But passes are are a little bit harder. So if you don't mind, let's let's just quickly kind of go through that. Um, according to Wikipedia, um, Freetown Christiania in Denmark, specifically in a subset of Copenhagen, 
is usually considered a pass. That's kind of debatable for other reasons, but that's what they list. Um, Dreamtime Village in southwestern Wisconsin is considered a pass for the most part. Um, there's uh, there's even actually probably and and then there's two other examples real quick. Um, the Zapatistas, for people who remember them from back in the 90s, who actually uh, actually took up arms against the Mexican federal government, uh, which actually is uh, <laughs> those guys in Chiapas are pretty awesome. I don't like their economics, but um, I, I definitely appreciate their machismo and a couple other things because they, they channeled their machismo towards something actually productive. Um, and they actually freed a good chunks of Chiapas, and, and now they're just kind of in a ceasefire, uh, and it's pretty much been that way ever since. But yeah, the Zapatista Autonomous Municipalities, it's uh, – that one's kind of debatable because it's more like a limited government type thing. Um, but some people have argued their passes, and they're, they're on the list, so that one's kind of debatable. Although, interestingly enough, for some reason, Rojava in northern Syria is also considered a pass. But that's uh, I don't strange. know. But, that's really strange. That's really strange because Rojava. But, uh, actually, there, are, there are a bunch of anarchists in Rojava, though. There are. Well, that's why Amir Taki went out and fought against ISIS. Literally, the the, crypt, the, right. the cryptocurrency programmer or just the, uh -huh. the developer. Yeah, he uh -huh. went out and fought against ISIS with uh, with the people, the anarchists of Rojava, because he wanted to introduce introduce them to Bitcoin. Uh, right. So it's pre yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool. But yeah, as a pass, strange. It, that, that's kind of a strange one because yeah, how, there how actually could a, is. Well, how could a war zone be a pass? <laughs> well, it's not. Well, it's not even so much that. Although that that's that's a mitigating factor. That's that we can't ignore. I would say just just as a political science, you know, graduate or whatever. Um, uh, there actually is the constitution of Rojava, and there is a Rojavan government that is not recognized by the so-called international community of uh, nation states populated by tyrants and so forth. Mm, okay. Um. So. So Rojava has a government formally organized. Well, you know, so let me let me just compare and contrast for a second. Whether the Zapatistas have a government or not is very debatable. So they could be a PAS, they could be a, like a limited government type thing. The Zapatistas, eh, they freed Chiapas and they're at a, they're, they they've had a ceasefire with the Mexican federal government. So their thing is kind of unclear. Other so so they would be closer to a PAS, I guess. But the Rojavans. The Rojavans have an actual government. They 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 were secessionists. They have a border that they've maintained. They are trying <laughs> to be a nation state, and so far they act like it. Um, and so yeah, it's a good thing that they really don't have any laws for the most part, and in, in terms of like um you know monopoly uh, legal services or whatever. So I guess that's a plus. But at that point, it's like well well then Freetown Christiania and Dreamtime Village in Denmark and Wisconsin respectively. Those would be more like a more like pure passes of sorts, and then the Zapatistas are kind of a weird in between one. But the Rojavans, as much as I like mm, the Rojavans, yeah. as much as I like the Rojavans, they really do have a government. Like there's a constitution and stuff. So well, I, I guess I guess maybe like you can have permanent autonomous zones that aren't uh, that like you can have passes within the United States, and they're still the United States government. So maybe the anarchists yeah. there are setting up their own passes inside Rojava, um, but there is uh, outside. That's their second realm. And the first realm is the Rojavan government. That's po you know that's possible, but obviously to try and make decisions about that would would be like another episode in itself, where we'd have to go through the nitty gritty and try and figure out what exactly the situation is there. Ideally, we, you know, getting some interviews with some of the Rojavans would be who can speak English uh, would, would be the ideal situation. But at least for now, just looking at different examples, what my point is this: it's a lot harder to find re solid real world examples of what a permanent autonomous zone actually is in practice as opposed to looking at actual real examples of temporary autonomous zones in in actual real practice tazes are a lot easier to do and a lot more um, getting to the point of being more ubiquitous as opposed to passes which really is kind of rocky at best and that's on a good day that's all i'm saying Right, right. So uh, I guess let's go ahead and move forward here. So the, the as as I said earlier, the the guy who uh, wrote the uh, the essays on these subjects, his name is Akeem Bay. I think it would uh, behoove us to uh, you know learn a little bit about him uh, before we dig into uh, some excerpts and some to some discussion points. So uh, this is from Wikipedia. And uh, by the way, Hakeem Bay was a pseudonym. His real name is Peter Lamborn uh, Wilson. So uh, Wilson is the son of Douglas Emery Wilson, an editor at Harvard Uni University Press, and Rolf Waldo Emerson, scholar, and Margaret Packwood. 
his parents divorced when he was 13. Let's see if we can get to some juicier information. Uh, while undertaking a classics major at Columbia University, Wilson met Warren uh, Tart Tartaglia, uh, then introducing Islam to students as the leader of a group called the Noble Moors. Attracted by the philosophy, Wilson was invited into the group, but later joined a group of breakaway members who founded the Moorish Orthodox Church. The church maintained a presence at the League for Spiritual Discovery, the group established by Timothy Leary, and it's, it is alleged uh, Wilson would visit it for supplies of LSD. Appalled by the social and political climate, Wilson had also decided to leave America, and shortly after the assassination of MLK Jr. in 1968, he flew to Lebanon. In the words of Michael Muhammad Knight, the emerging post-colonial world was crowded with American hippies blowing their trust funds on mystical quests, and Wilson was one of them. So he was definitely kind of this uh, spiritual sort of... Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, his, uh, the, the actual name, Hakim Bey, his pen name, uh, is derived from Il, Il Hakim, the alchemist king, with Bey a further nod to Moorish science. Wilson's two personal uh, two personas as himself and Bey are facilitated by his publishers, who provide separate author biographies, even when they both appear in the same publication. Uh, so definitely interesting. Uh, spiritual kind of, uh, I guess, if, if, we had to, if we had to put it this way, more of kind of a leftist anarchist. Uh, which isn't a bad thing, which uh, definitely isn't a bad thing. I guess one other interesting uh, point here in this Wikipedia article, quote, Wilson traveled on to Pakistan. There he lived in several places, mixing with princes, Sufis, and gutter, dw gutter dwellers, and moving from tea houses to opium dens. In Quetta, he found a total disregard, he found a total disregard of all government, uh, with people reliant on family, clans, or tribes, which appealed to the anarchist in him, uh, end quote. So he did a lot of traveling in the Middle East, and uh, I guess he found some... Uh, some really interesting stuff over there. Uh, so I guess that's a little background on him. Uh, what do you have, Kyle? Well, I would I would just say that you know his um, for anybody who actually looked at his writing style and such, you know it's 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 funny the the way that he tries to promote living without rulers is he really does appeals to emotion quite a bit. It's frustrating and, <laughs> to read. His writing style well, is so frustrating. To be to be fair, that does actually appeal to some people. So as like a marketing ploy or whatever, I, I guess that could work, I guess. Um, I mean, I, I enjoyed reading it, but like it, this, the entire time, it's like, wow, you could have put this so much simpler, so much more simpler. Yeah, but, you, uh, you, yeah. Use, you use a lot less words to make the same point instead of these like long rambling. Yeah, it, could, and it could have been a five page five page essay instead of like a fifteen page one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're t we're talking kind of really right brained here, unfortunately, uh, which doesn't really translate well to a page where you really need a left brain to actually kind of you know make, get it down to almost like a formula, so you know we're not wasting everybody's time. Um, I, I would just say this. You know, I, I don't – I know that a lot of people still think in terms of like the left-right paradigm and such. I think maybe a better dichotomy to describe different types of anarchists or at least how people kind of come to the conclusion that the state is an unnecessary evil. If you had to put an adjective on it, if you had to, and it's more a descriptor of people's personalities in terms of how they came to, uh, you know, without rulers as it were – is like soft versus hard, I think might be a better dichotomy to at least consider. So soft would be your more appeals to emotion, our feel good thing, and the state makes us feel bad, therefore, and we want to feel good, therefore no government, right? Is is kind of the more, I guess, logical way of, and rational way of trying to describe like the the, so, the softy, you know, uh, what was the other version too that what's his face came up with, like relational anarchism or whatever the hell it was? Yes, yes, that, his, that's soft. And he talked about soft and hard anarchism too. So yeah, yeah. So so the, that that's a soft type thing. And then for people who who really just want to kind of can we just like save everybody a lot of time and and heartache and all that? And we, let, let's just kind of get to. Uh, whether the state is is really necessary in any sense, it's like, um, yeah, let's kind of think through this. We can take a more utilitarian approach, and either and look at things like democide, for instance, or if you want to take more of an a priori approach. I personally think argumentation ethics is really the way to go. And so for the, uh, I guess you could say the hard anarchists, whether they like argumentation ethics or not, I think things more along those lines where you're looking at the world as objectively as you possibly can and then coming to the conclusion that, well, governments really aren't good for human beings. In fact, actually government as a concept is actually anti-human, which is uh, something I've really kind of come to um, because it is really alien and foreign in ways and brings out the worst in people, quite frankly. Uh, then it's kind of like, okay, well, you know, we don't need to spend the rest of our lives doing 20 million different appeals to emotion. We just need to take it maybe at least a little bit of time. And depending on where people are coming from, if they want a more utilitarian, you know, uh, even empirical approach, we can look at things. 
like uh, like how many wars has the United States government participated, how many periods of peace versus how many periods of war. Uh, we can look at the evils of central banking and such. We can kind of go through different elements of the state and then kind of really come to a conclusion about whether uh, trade-offs are worth it or not. Or yep. we can pretty much, or we can pretty much kind of go along the lines of um, you know does the government really protect our rights or, or liberty or whatever. And and then and then of course my personal favorite is argumentation ethics, where we can actually save everybody a lot of time, even for people who are more hard or, or leaning more towards the hard anarchist approach. And we can kind of really kind of get this down to pretty much like one conversation, I think. Um, not that it's going to instantly yeah, you convert would, you people. Would, you would think, but when I, I – one of my family members, I did present argumentation ethics to him, and it didn't make sense to him, which I, I don't know how – like I just – there's the one way to – there's one way that I've come up with it for explaining it, and uh, you know I did that with him, and he's like, I don't understand what that's supposed to – you know Because they don't – because they don't comprehend private property. That's exactly, why. Exactly, exactly. So, so it's not – it's not a um, – it, it might be good for some some very few people, but sure. generally speaking, I think it's just – like it just confirms what libertarians and anarchists already knew, uh, at least to some extent. Well, it's a logical proof, and it basically shows that people who uh, who basically don't value private property are hypocrites because they have to use their own private property, their mind and their speech and so forth, uh, even if their fingers, if they're typing, right, uh, to basically argue against their ability to type and speak and so forth. That's why socialists are contradictory is because uh, they use their own private property to basically advocate for public property is kind of what it comes down to. And unfortunately, I, I, that's the really brief overview of argumentation ethics real here quickly, and unfortunately – a lot of people are not very rational. Frankly, they're very irrational as the empire is crumbling uh, and collapsing, much like Rome did. And so, uh, yeah, let's make Rome great again is what people should be saying, even the conservatives. And But of course, they're not going to do that because it's – because by, even by saying let's make Rome great again – um, that's kind of implying that uh, the, uh, the the whole pattern... thing's going to come crumbling to the ground. <laughs> hey, hey, hey! Rome was a republic first, and then it became an empire. America yep. was a republic first, and then it became a what? Yeah, the you know history kind of repeats itself. If of course you're repeating the mistakes of the past without actually learning from it. So Hakeem Bey's approach about appeals to emotion, all that, is not necessarily a bad thing because people do respond to it. I'm simply saying it just imposes opportunity costs, uh, quite frankly, because there are there are other also other. I mean, it's like it's like the free market and try. It's like the f different free market approaches and trying to basically kind of appeal to people's you know better sense of uh, of, of, of being human, I suppose. Where hey, let's not coerce our fellow man, right? Uh, whether you're doing it personally as a private criminal or or publicly uh, through the state. And unfortunately, people don't really think of it in those terms because they really believe the pablum. Uh, coming from different socialization agents, whether it's the public schools or even corporate media or, or even other agents like their parents, right? People like people become authoritarians because their parents were authoritarians. Um, and it's basically like, okay, so, uh, you know, the police officers protect us and um, military keeps us safe from foreign aggression and basically lie after lie after lie after lie. And of course, the welfare state's great and helps poor people, right? Um, it's it, it's kind of that kind of same thing over and over and over again. And so the, the big question in some ways is, how do you deprogram people from that kind of thing? And so there's these different free market approaches. Some people do appeals to emotion, which is soft anarchism. Some people do kind of the more fact-based and or logically based like hard anarchism and so forth. And I guess as we move forward through time, I guess we'll find out which one is more efficacious. I have my suspicions, but uh, I'm yep. not going to say that here. Yep, I, but, I, I don't think point, just telling people they're beautiful and that they're powerful is going to, you know, do, it's, and not, yeah, it's not going to bring certain, about a free world, guys. Yeah, sorry. And there's, certain, and there's certain celebritarians who shall remain unnamed, who uh, some of whom I, I, I admire, some of whom I used to admire, who really kind of like doing that softy you are free you are beautiful and and so forth and uh despite some other good elements that they have uh some good things that they've pushed for every time that happens i really kind of go irksome on it because i know they're doing the softy feel good approach and i don't think that's appropriate because you and i are adults we are dealing with hardened killers and murderers and embezzlers that's central banking and the federal reserve and really nasty people who basically are trying to make humanity go extinct. And that's not an exaggeration, especially when you look at the really freaky transhumanist stuff coming out. So the issue and, is... And nuclear weapons too. 
Oh well, I, oh geez, I forgot about that. Sorry, that was something Rayo was really concerned <laughs> forgot, about. So, you forgot about that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's kind of like which world ending thing do you kind of have to worry about first in some sense. And so it's kind of like, okay, first, everybody take a breath. <gasps> Secondly, how do we approach this as adults? And I personally do not see how making people feel good is a rather adult approach. So when some of the conservative pundits that I've been watching as of late, even some of the women who shall remain unnamed, are very much kind of an in-your-face, you know, uh, we have to like, I hate using the term, but man up almost. When some of the conservative women are doing that to their base, it's more the tone and the approach that that I think is almost a little bit better. But then, of course, they're they're promoting that form of authoritarianism, which I don't like, of course. But it's but it's almost I would rather almost get in people's faces and say, hey, look, this is the nature of what we're suffering under. Here are some facts. Here's why the tyrants are tyrants and why they're wrong for enslaving you. And here are some options and direct action and, you know, freedom umbrella and and Vanu and all that kind of stuff. And here's, you know, some things that you may want to consider doing so that we, you know, so that we're not go into the grave earlier than we should and 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 so forth so we can have some degree of liberty freedom and or vanu in in our lifetimes and that's kind of where i'm just at is is just can can we not like fall into the you know existential abyss can we not uh you know be the victims of oceania like we're like we're living in through 1984 or something orwell's 1984 that's a really good that's a really good uh segue into the uh the first excerpt so can we go ahead and get to that Oh, yes, please. All right. Okay, we can continue that after, but you, like that's just a, such a good segue. Uh, so we're going to introduce uh, the concept of temporal autonomous zones and kind of just more of an overall introduction by Hakeem Bey. He says, quote, Are we who live in the present doomed never to experience autonomy, never to stand for one moment on a bit of land ruled only by freedom? Are we reduced either to nostalgia for the past or nostalgia for the future? Must we wait until the entire world is free of political control before even one of us can claim to know freedom? logic and emotion unite to condemn such a supposition reason demands that one cannot struggle for what one does not know and the heart revolts at a universe so cruel as to visit such injustices on our generations alone on our generation alone uh, of humankind to say that quote i will not be free till all humans or all sentient creatures are free and quote is simply to cave into a kind of nirvana stupor to abdicate our humanity to define ourselves as losers I believe, that by, I, I believe that by extrapolating from past and future stories about islands and the net, we may collect evidence to suggest that a, a certain kind of free enclave is not only possible in our time, but also existent. All my research and speculation has crystallized around the concept of temporary autonomous zone, uh, hereby abbreviated TAS. Despite its synthesizing force uh, for my own thinking, however, I don't intend the TAS to be taken as more than an essay attempt, a suggestion almost a poetic fancy. Despite the occasional ranterish enthusiasm of my language, I'm not trying to construct political dogma. In fact, I have deliberately refrained from defining the task. I circle around the subject, firing, firing off ex uh, exploratory beams. In the end, the task is almost self-explanatory. If the phrase became current, it would be understood without difficulty. Understood in action, end quote. Uh, so that's kind of introducing the concept. And as I mentioned earlier uh the first point i want to mention is that uh you know tazis temporary autonomous zones those are festivals like the midwest peace and liberty fest or anarchon uh in virginia put on by liberate rva uh the taz is you know it can be a, a freedom festival uh it can be a rave you know uh you know the, what those uh, young kids are doing going and taking drugs and you know partying to uh, electronic music yeah uh you know those are temporary autonomous zones they are uh some more invulnerable to coercion than others sure some more spontaneous uh you know not like uh you know every single night nightclubs but um, yeah, there's a lot of really interesting examples of Taz's now. Uh, there, there, there really are. Uh, I guess some other ones are the uh, the RTR crew, the uh, the month, or I guess the yearly meetup that's uh, Van Nomads out there in the in the desert somewhere in the West. That's definitely a Taz, and uh, it's there's there's a lot of them that exist today. There really are. You know, when you were saying that, I, I was thinking about history and, you know, those speakeasies back, I think it was in the 20s during uh, alcohol prohibition, you know, uh, you know, a lot of those places, you know, in, in some ways, I guess they were in some sense, they were Taz's too, because whenever the, the bludgies would raid those speakeasies, people had to like kind of scatter out. And that was really the only form of protection. So like early detection systems were actually rather important in, in, in one ways, although they didn't have really a lot of technology relative to us in this time period, they had the kind of the idea down. And even in the second round book on strategy, they kind of mentioned something like we need better early detection systems so we can evacuate everybody. 
So the Taz and the second realm is is in a lot of ways more similar than not. However, you're right in saying that Taz is, as a concept is geared more towards festivities, almost a carnival atmosphere in some sense, where you're, you're going there to have fun, but also trade, uh, maybe even get laid, uh, or, or maybe some other things. Um, again, if it's a free market, you know, individuals have different desires, different interests, different demands, and there's yep. different supplies of things. So, you know, some people might want to get high. Some people may, uh, may maybe even even maybe something that emulates uh, a little bit more uh, more mainstream in some ways, like playing video games or something. I don't know, or or board games. I mean, people have different people have different interests, uh, but it's but it's really not going to be uh, closed off too much. I mean. I would suspect that certain things that have been pushed down, squeezed out, uh, prohibited in the first realm uh, would, would pretty much come out uh, during a TAS, at least to some degree. So I'm not oh, yeah. really all that surprised. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. So I guess just uh, I guess one other note there. And, uh, you know, just due to, you know, as as in depth we've gotten on LUA and also Vanu, uh, I'm not going to, you know, go into this too much. But <clears throat> I guess the, the philosophical reasons why people say these sorts of things. But. I guess maybe the psychological reasons, but, um, but yeah, I mean, the, I will, I will not be free to all humans or sentient creatures are free. I mean, that's, uh, that's a really, it's a kind of a shitty life. It really is. It's, it's it almost, almost sounds some like well-meaning leftist back during when Bush Jr. was president. I remember some of them saying stuff like that too. And, and, and I, I even talked to a few of them back then, like when I was in college and said, you know, you could just kind of start slowly, you know, kind of pushing back against the system by, you know, doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I was mainly and, doing and culture jamming thank, at the time. And thankfully, since then, that's changed a little bit, right? With the tiny house yeah. movement, with uh, Van yeah. Nomad, the Van Nomad movement, that's yeah. uh, motivated kind of by, uh, I guess, leftist aspirations. But st but still, you know, they, yes. they had that yes. they had that phase of, uh, you know, well, you know, we... I, yeah, we've we've it got was to, political we, we've crusading. Got to, yeah, we, we've got to fix things so everyone's free. We can't, uh, you know, we can't just leave our fellow man behind. And then eventually they said, okay, uh, you know, this is better on the environment. This is a more frugal lifestyle, uh, consuming less, uh, and uh, you know, I can travel and do all the things that I want to do. Uh, my time, my my time is my own. And they said, okay, well, I can go be free and I can help the environment and I can also, you know, start a YouTube channel and talk to people about this this great thing. And, uh, you know, I can help save people that way. Uh, so that's kind of, I think that's kind of the, the approach now. And I think that's a much better one, uh, even if there is kind of that, uh, the, um, the appeal to emotion sort of thing, uh, yeah. kind of the, the collective movement aspect, uh, they're still partaking in direct action. So I think that's definitely, definitely a positive. Oh, I think there's been a sea change with, with more of the well-meaning leftists that, that I've known and such where uh, you're right. They have pretty much have gone from the political crusading, the more pure version of that. They've gone from political crusading towards direct action. And yes, they're still kind of the leftover controlled schizophrenia and even the collective movementism at least to some degree. But – in terms of shades of gray, I would say as a whole, from what I can tell, just from my little, you know, analyst chair, so to speak, I would say there's a lot less of that. Um, I mean, yeah, they'll they'll mention it. They'll call it a tiny house movement, but it's it's not even. But it, it's hard for it's hard to really say that's a movement because it's not right. like a, like a collective movement. Like we're going to go out here and protest. We're going to get together. And there's and do no this. organization. And, like, and yeah, there's no. And, and, we're, and we're, we're, we're going to have a movement and go to our separate houses. Huh. Yeah, 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 <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, right. And my favorite part is even even as a collective movement, even possibly. From what I can tell, they don't really have any of the weaknesses that I've written about before uh, regarding, you know, collective movement uh, movementism, where they basically are selling out their own people and they're being hypocrites. No, I mean the closest thing is that they have it, the, the relationships they have are more peer to peer. So there's no like, and here's the other thing: there's no formal organizations for like tiny home people. Again, just to be clear to everybody, I am not advocating that thing. In fact, I'm saying don't do that. But if you look at how they actually act. It's very much peer to peer for the most part, which I think is good. And in some ways, I think they're kind of avoiding what some of the Bitcoiners have kind of fallen into, where they've yeah, been doing the whole organization. Yeah. Well, some of the more uh, Bitcoiners who want, uh, you know, uh, government regulation of cryptocurrencies Fair for enough, some god awful yeah. reason, are very much doing the collective movementism thing, and even going one more step, and even doing downright political crusading. So, in some ways, I think the tiny house people are on a better track. 
uh, in terms of direct action. But then, of course, to be fair, a lot of Bitcoiners don't like uh, the the, lo- the lobbyists and so forth. Um, but what I'm saying is I kind of compare and contrasting some of these. Um, yeah, I mean, the idea is that the trend towards more lifestyle changes, the trend towards more decentralized uh, activities in general, I think is very, very healthy. And for those of us in um, the alternative media or even the free media, uh, I, anything that we can proselytize or advocate for is more of that kind of thing. You know, people taking responsibility for their own lifestyle choices and encouraging them to do more and more direct action where they can help their fellow men and trade and all that. So I guess let's go ahead and get on to this next ex- excerpt here. We're about an hour through, so um, we can stop and talk about whatever, but I'm going to go ahead and read the second excerpt. Uh, it's about the uh, the net or the web. Quote, the present forms of the unofficial web are, one must suppose, still rather primitive. The marginal z- uh, zine network, the BBS networks, pirated software, hacking, phone breaking, or phone freaking, uh, some influence in print and radio, almost none in the other big media, no TV stations, no satellites, no fiber optics, no cable, etc., etc. However, the net itself presents a pattern of changing and evolving relations between subjects, users, and objects, data. The nature of these relations has been exhaustively explored from McLuhan to Virilio. It would take these. It would. It would take pages and pages to prove what by now everyone knows. Rather than rehash it all, I'm interested in asking how these uh, evolving relations suggest modes of imp- implementation uh, for the task. Uh, ellipses. At this moment in the evolution of the web, and considering our demands for the face-to-face and the sensual, we must consider the web primarily as a support system capable of carrying information from one TAS to another, of defending the TAS, rendering it invisible or giving it teeth as a situation might demand. But more than that, if the TAS is a nomad camp, then the web helps provide the epics, songs, genealogies, and legends of the tribe. It provides the secret caravan routes and raiding trails which make up the flow lines of tribal economy. It even contains some of the very roads they will follow, some of the very dreams they will experience as signs and portents. Uh, ellipses, skipping just a little bit further. Uh, the story of computer networks, BBSs, and various other experiments in electro-democracy has so far been one of hobbyism for the most part. Many anarchists and libertarians have deep faith in the PC as a weapon of liberation and self-liberation, but no real gains to show, no palpable liberty. Uh, end quote. So back when he wrote this, which was in the 1990s, uh, I don't think he was necessarily wrong. Uh, I don't think he was necessarily wrong, Uh, but now it's gone beyond hobbyism, and it definitely is a tool of web. It's it's definitely a weapon of liberation and self liberation, uh, mainly mainly with things like uh, like blockchain technology and uh, decentralization, things like that. So, I think he's. uh, It's an interesting. It's an interesting way to tie in uh, technology to temporary autonomous zones, and he does provide some examples as to how uh, the internet can facilitate uh, some activities that Tazis will uh, partake in. Well, what he's really describing is what the first realm would call social media, isn't he? I mean, remember, this was written back in 1991, so he's kind of trying to kind of look out uh, at the current technology and kind of extrapolating from there. So, yeah, when you go, you can go from pretty much from BBS networks to um, some people would say fascist book, but I think a better example would be other forms of peer to peer. I mean, hell, Shane, even how you and I. Steam it would would be a great example of that. Yeah, and you can get paid too, yeah. But even how you and I talk to each other, too, I mean, that I mean, we're using the Internet right now to kind of make this happen. So yep. that's yeah, that's that's something else that that I think, you know, uh, VoIP technology, pref- you know, obviously the encrypted version of ZRTP is preferable, but sometimes that's not possible for other reasons. Um, but, yeah, that's 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 kind of the idea is essentially using uh, digital technology and computer networks to essentially facilitate the formation of uh, neo neo nomadic tribes in in one sense, um, which I think is not is not too bad because where else are you going to get your intentional communities from? Um, I would agree with him that you do need something. Uh, how did he put it? Considering our demands for the face to face and the sensual, we must consider the web primarily as a support system. So yeah, in other words, in order to actually have those intentional communities, which are you know physically together, you know we might have to actually use the internet. Basically, I mean, like, what is the internet? I mean, basically, what it really is is a communicate is a telecommunications and data retrieval system. That being said. Uh, it's very invaluable because, like uh, do- how Dr. Mikio Kaku described it, who's a theoretical physicist who I've read s- several of his books and I even did a book report on one of them. Um, he basically described the internet as a primitive version of a type one uh, s- civilization's telephone system, which is basically global. 
Um, that's more or less accurate, I suppose, because I've been able to talk to people who are in Ireland and I didn't have to like have nasty phone charges and so forth for international calls because of how VoIP technology works. So that's not uh, completely crazy that maybe perhaps using the internet such as it is and even better versions of the internet, especially uh, the more encrypted it can get, can actually help facilitate people to actually come together in a physical way. Hell, you want to look at like flash mobs or, or, or flash dancing or, or versions on a theme of those kind of things? A lot of that stuff was done through what the first realm would call social media, where people coordinating. Yes, even if they did it over Twitter, which is something I don't recommend, but there's alternatives to the more mainstream websites where you can still kind of connect with people, uh, even if it was something like like Signal or Telegram or, or, or one of those other apps that, that at least is pri trying to be a privacy enhancing technology, a PET, if you will. So I think Hakeem Bey was trying to kind of extrapolate from the current technology that was available back in 91 and trying to see how could that facilitate uh, people essentially coming together and building uh, communities of any kind. And now we're in, uh, let's see, the year of our Lord 2018, so to speak. Um, I, I think it's rather interesting to see how that's kind of come to fruition. Um, however, I, I do have an however, and obviously I don't think you could really foresee this. Notice also, too, how people have abused the internet when you look at things like doxing or you look at the promotion and even advocacy and the f facilitation and enabling of things like political crusading vis-a-vis so-called social media, uh, such as getting on fascist book and say, you know, vote for my uh, political uh, candidate, authoritarian of the week kind of thing. So Yeah, and, and, the, and the internet mainly being used for most folks is being a tool for entertainment, and rarely I'll do that. I'll do that sometimes, but uh, the, there's, there's, so much, like, there's so much information there, and people just uh, – a lot of people aren't self-directed uh, learners, so – Right, uh, and so, so that's yeah, that's not, that's definitely a miss. I, 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 I'm not necessarily a misuse, but um, it's unfortunate that the internet's not being used for that by a lot of folks. Right, and so there is a potential to use it more along the lines of Hakeem Bay was kind of pushing for, and and others. But that's not that's not a failure of technology. What that is a failure of is is uh, people's uh, lack of desire for freedom or even vanu uh, at that point where they don't really want to be, as the mainstream parlance goes, they don't want to be free. Uh, they want to be slaves. They like slavery and so forth. And I'm, I'm going to call and call a spade a spade because when you're paying taxes, when you're subjected to a fiat currency that gets debased and inflated beyond recognition, you are a slave. The only different version is that it's the democratic version of slavery where you have the hypothetical freedom to choose your own occupation instead of the ancient Egyptian model of slavery where there's whips and chains. It's still slavery. Call it what it is. But people are in – but most of Main Street people are in denial about it. I see it all the time when I go to work. So I mean this I mean this is so when people not to get spiritual on you because Hakeem Bey has plenty of that in, in, his, in his articles. But you have to look at where people's consciousness is, or maybe a better way of putting it is you have to look at where their maturity really is. And I would argue actual adults recognize the real threats to their liberty uh, in you know, by the state, and they are acting accordingly. But then again, I don't think most people are grown-up adults as, as far as I can tell, right, not the ones right. I can cross. Yeah, yeah, and I think we're we're a step further now that uh, these tasks could be facilitated on a uh, on a blockchain. Anyways, anyways, uh, let's go ahead and move forward here. So the uh, uh, third excerpt, uh, point number two, gone to Croatan. Uh, so Kyle, whenever uh, I was preparing for this episode by reading, uh, you know, his article, you pointed to this section as being the most significant. Uh, so why is that? I guess uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, yeah, why why is it important? Okay. I personally, in my subjective valuation, consider this the most important, the idea of Gone to Croatan, which you could argue is maybe a more uh, a more serious version of, go of you know, Gone Fishing. Uh, might be, it might be an easier, relatable way of thinking about it. Uh, but Gone to Croatan, is a, it's more of a permanent one-way thing, where you really are abandoning – uh, this 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 so-called wonderful notion of Western civilization, uh, such as has become corrupted in, in the way that it has, uh, pretty much widespread globally and such. You're pretty much and 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 so forth. Well, and I guess I guess maybe more of a more of a somewhat more historically accurate way of putting it, which will segue nicely into what you're about to read here, is when you had like the first colonists come to this continent, they were trying to get away from Europe. They were trying to get away from the monarchs that were there. 
They were trying to get away from the authoritarianism that ruined their lives and and enabled a and encouraged the formation of a strict class system, especially in England, which is not entirely different from the caste system in India. So, you know, again, the more things change, the more they stay the same in some sense. So you have you have those people from Europe who who honestly were looking for any even a smidgen of freedom who risked their lives to get across the Atlantic and, and many of them died but of the ones who survived they got here and yeah they would set up there would be the official uh, co colonial charters for like a certain colony or whatever but then at some point but then there were different people who just said screw this I'm gonna go native so the notion of gone to Croatan is, is a more uh, specific way of saying going native or gone native. And it's very interesting that anybody who goes native and even to the extent of, you know, falling in love and reproducing, shall we say, mixed what some people would consider mixed children. What about uh, off-grid homesteading? Well, that would count, too. Um, but anybody who basically tries to get away from that first realm in any respect is pretty much demonized um, as extremists, as radicals, as criminals, as uh, all sorts of nasty labels of, of one kind or another. And that's and that's because they're basically thumbing their nose at, at how Western civilization has become corrupted such as it is. Um, that's just bottom line what it is. And so, yes, the, uh, the notion of what you're about to read here about uh, the gray-eyed Indians – uh, and versions on a theme thereof are are basically, and that's and that's I think why uh, the very existentiality of people who are usually considered by anthropologists to be ethnically mixed is the hard proof that there are people who sincerely got away from from Europe and really kind of repudiated European authoritarianism and and the nas and again it's not even so much the colon the the the, the so-called uh, colonialism that the left likes to make a point uh, likes to like demonize or whatever uh, use it as a straw man it's not even so much that it's the entire colossal leviathan that's the issue so even if there was never was a colonial period with colonialism and and all sorts of atrocity against the native folks even if that never happened that doesn't therefore exonerate the state from how they oppress their own people back in england or france or germany or pick a place so you basically have people fleeing, fleeing these monarchies, fleeing these what are now considered to be parliamentary democracies and all their 20 million thousand problems or whatever. And so, yeah, gone to Croatan is a repudiation of all of it, as far as I can tell. Right, right. So let's go ahead and uh, get to it. Quote, we were taught in elementary school that the first settlements in Roanoke failed. The uh, colonists disappeared, leaving behind them only the cryptic message, gone to Croatan. Later reports of gray-eyed Indians were dismissed as legend. What really happened, the textbook implied, was that the Indians massacred the defenseless settlers. However, Croatan was not some El Dorado. It was the name of a neighboring tribe of friendly Indians. Apparently, the settlement was simply moved back from the coast into the Great Dismal Swamp and, they, and, and absorbed into the tribe. And the gray-eyed Indians were uh, real. They're still there, and they still call themselves Croatans. So the first, very, the very first colony in the New World chose to renounce its contract with Prospero, D. Rowley, and Empire, and go over to the Wild Men with Caliban. They dropped out. They became Indians, went native, opted for chaos over the appalling miseries of surfing, uh, S.E.R.F., uh, for the plutocrats and, 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 and intellectuals of London. As America came into being where once there had been Turtle Island, Croatan remained embedded in its collective, in its collective psyche. Out beyond the frontier, the state of nature, i.e. no state, still prevailed, and within the consciousness of these settlers, the option of wilderness always lurked. The temptation to give up on church, farm work, literacy, taxes, all the burdens of civilization and go to Croatan, or some way or another, in some way or another. Moreover, as the revolution in England was betrayed, first by Cromwell and then by, the, by, by Restoration, waves of Protestant radicals fled or were transported into the New World, uh, which had now become a prison, a place of exile. Antinomians, familias, rogue Quakers, levelers, diggers, and ranters were now introduced to the occult shadow of wilderness and rushed to embrace it. End quote. Uh, so yeah, I think you put you you basically laid out a very good uh, explanation for what he what he's talking about here. Uh, that's that's pretty incredible. Yeah, and so basically anybody who thumbs their nose at, at corrupt Western uh, values of whatever kind, whether it comes from the state or even the mainstream culture, is is basically demonized. And again, it wasn't just the Croatans. 
Um, just very briefly, Hakeem Bay also kind of goes and, and gives some other examples, whether it would be the Buccaneers, uh, the Maroons, um, I think the Rompogs of northern New Jersey, uh, some people that might be considered like the Moors of Delaware and the Bene Ishmalis who migrated from Kentucky to Ohio in the mid-18th century. What I'm trying to get at is this. There are all sorts of different kinds of people's plural that live on this continent. Some of them get along, some of them don't. But they each have their own unique identities, whether uh, whether that is ethnically based or not. However, each one of them is a is considered a threat to the first realm because they refuse to play the homogenous. Uh, let's all wear the diversity t-shirt game that leftism likes to promote so much specifically. So, you know, so when you have certain uh, even authoritarian conservatives basically try to be a little bit, have a little bit of integrity and try to try to basically make suggestions like, well, maybe we should like, you know, kind of segregate off and have, you know, have communities with very restrictive covenants. There's a reason why the first realm really kind of recoils at that because they never want anybody to escape. They never want anybody to escape. And so whether it yep. would be people of a more conservative uh, leaning or it's people who are more uh, like the American Indian, uh, various different types of American Indians, whether it be the Cherokee, the Apache, uh, the Mandans, the, uh, you know, anybody else I forgot. Sorry, there's a lot There's a lot of different, different peoples, uh, plural, that lived here and still live here. Uh, there's just a lot less of them because, well, they threaten the power structure and that's why there's less of them, frankly. Uh, some of them I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm more likely than not related to. Um, I, I, so yeah, I do take it a little bit personally, frankly, um, because basically the government murdered some distant relatives of mine. And frankly, at this and, and and then I'm supposed to be grateful because they try to extend to me, you know, a, a while back uh, that maybe I should, you know, sign up with the BIA and and see maybe if I can get some government handouts. I mean, that that's just insulting, frankly. Um, they can frankly go to hell. And so part of that attitude of the first round can go to hell is, well, maybe we can, you know, go on to Croatan, not have a revolution, not uh, take up arms and try to kill all these authoritarians, but rather let's maybe kind of segregate off and try to be, live as peaceably as possible without being subjected to 20,000 different laws and driver's licenses and taxes and central banking and the bludgies and on and on and on, the entire you know list of grievances, so to speak. Um, this is a peace, peaceful solution, by the way, for anybody who uh, doesn't like to think strategically. Uh, this is a peaceful solution of going to Croatan, where you essentially you go native. Um, and so far, it seems to be at least at least partially efficacious for anybody who bothered to try. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, I, it's, I guess it's leave, leaving behind that uh, first realm and creating a second realm. Exactly, it's it's a different way of doing it, but but yeah, it's it's one way of doing it for sure. Right, right. So uh, um, this is the last excerpt for the Taz portion, and then we'll talk about Paz's. Moving a little, moving a little quickly, but uh, I, I think it's quite evident what we're trying to get across here. Uh, and you can obviously go and read these, uh, and I, I do recommend you do. Uh, I'll put them in the show notes. Go read uh, both of these essays by uh, Hakeem Bay. So excerpt number four: Rat holes in the Babylon of Information. Quote: The Taz is a conscious radical tactic. Uh, uh, the Taz, as a conscious radical tactic, will emerge under certain conditions. One, psychological liberation. That is, we must realize, make real, the moments and spaces in which freedom is not only possible, but actual. We must know in what ways we are genuinely oppressed and also in what ways we are self-repressed or ensnared in a fantasy in which ideas oppress us. Work, for example, is a far more actual, far more actual source of misery for most of us in legislative politics. Alienation is far more dangerous for us than toothless, outdated, dying ideologies. Mental addiction to ideals, which in fact turn out to be more projections of our resentment and sensations of victimization. We'll, uh, we'll never further our project. The Taz is not a harbinger of some pie-in-the-sky social utopia to which we must sacrifice our lives, that our, our lives that our children's children may breathe a bit of free air. The Taz must be the scene of our present autonomy, but it can only exist on the condition that we already know ourselves as free beings. Number two, the counternet must expand. At present, it reflects more abstraction than actuality. Zines and BBSs, BBSs exchange information, which is part of the necessary groundwork of the TAS, but very little of this information relates to, relates to concrete goods and services necessary for the autonomous life. We do not live in cyberspace. To dream that we do is to fall into cybernosis, the false transcendence of the body. 
The Taz is a physical place, and we are either in it or not. All the senses must be involved. The web is like a new sense in some ways, but it must be added to the others. The others must not be subtracted from it, as in some horrible parody of the mystic trance. Without the, web, without the web, the full realization of the Taz complex would be impossible, but the web is not the end itself, it's a weapon. Number three, the apparatus of control, the state, must, or so we must assume, continue to deliquesce and petrify simultaneously, must progress on its present course in which hysterical rigidity comes more and more to mask a vacuity as an abyss of, pow uh, <clears throat> an abyss of power. As power disappears, our, our will to power must be disappearance. And uh, Ellipsy's moving forward just a little bit. Uh, let, us admit, let us admit that we have attended parties where for one brief night, a republic of gratified desires was attained. Shall we not confess that the politics of that night might have more reality and force us, and force for us than those, of, than those of, say, the entire U.S. government? Some of the parties we've mentioned lasted for two or three years. Is this something worth imagining, worth fighting for? Let us study invisibility, web working, psychic nomadism. And who knows what, what we might attain, uh, end quote. So there's a lot to uh, unpack there. Uh, there really is. So that, uh, that first thing, psychological liberation. And this is something that when I first became an anarchist, I was definitely more of uh, the hard anarchist variety. Uh, because I didn't really want to look at the spirituality, uh, kind of uh, spirituality, kind of the psychological, emotional side at all, you know. You know, the, the state exists. Let's examine how, uh, you know, its actions uh, and, you know, hopefully, you know, uh, bring more people to anarchism, you know, show them the truth about the state. Yeah, but I now I, I do think that's kind of important because even if um, even if these folks are anarchists and they want to create second realms, having, you know, really damaged people in these spaces might not be a good idea, right? Um, so obviously the physical freedom is important, but that kind of mental psychological freedom is absolutely crucial too, uh, you know, where you exercise your demons, you exercise your collectivist spooks, and you exercise all of those things that are harmful to you uh, and harmful to your freedom. Yeah, let's let's not let's not encourage controlled schizophrenia. Let's in fact try to cure it as as much as possible for those people who actually want to be cured of controlled schizophrenia, right? I mean, I, I think that's kind of that's kind of the starting point at, at bare minimum. Yes. You know, when 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 Hakeem Bey was mentioning about we must know in what ways we are genuinely oppressed, not the fake uh, oppression that the left likes to make a point about, but genuinely oppressed. <clears throat> civil asset forfeiture being one, and also in way, what ways we are self-oppressed or ensnared in a fantasy in which ideas oppress us. That's interesting. That he sounds just like Sam Konkin in the Agoras Primer. Because remember, he was mentioning uh, Sam Konkin mentioned something about along the lines of you know exorcising the collectivist spooks. He didn't phrase it like that, but it was something along those lines. And Hakeem Bey is saying something similar here, isn't he? Because uh, I think mm -hmm. Konkin mentioned something about you know maybe. If not necessarily therapy, but but some version of either alone or in groups, you know, ro or as Rayo put it, ro rooting out the outposts. I think so. You have right. these different guys in these different time periods expressing more or less the same idea, but explaining it in different ways and different flavors, different angles of looking at uh, the elephant in the room, so to speak, which I think, which I think is is more reliable than not because they're actually kind of pointing to something that I think is probably true. Uh, something else I want to point out real quick, when Hakeem Bey then says in the next sentence about work, for example, is a former actual source of misery for most of us than legislative politics. What I think he's referring to is, is more uh, the corporate America drudgery, like with one of my employers that I've been very vocal about in terms of how much I don't like working there. Um, I think that's more relative than not. Again, my two other employers are pretty okay. Um, but I would halfway agree with, with, with Hakeem here that depending on your employer, it could actually be a real more source of misery than the latest awful thing the state did this week. That's very much case by case basis. Um, he's right in the sense that it's it's more of a daily reality if you are you know basically being treated like irresponsible little brat even though even if the lower management admits you did nothing wrong which has been my experience so far uh, but then again with my other employers they don't have a problem with anything so it, it's really it depends what your own specific situation is and then of course the cherry on top of that is well if you're pursuing financial independence early retirement and or you're an entrepreneur you can basically hop skip jump over all of that so um, I, I guess Hakeem has a little bit of a bias here in some ways in terms of work. Well, work could also be an entrepreneur too. Um, so where is he going with that? I, so that's why I'm assuming he's talking about, about more like corporate bureaucracy and things more along those lines. But again, that's an assumption I'm making. He didn't actually say that though. 
Um, so, you know, I am, I, I, I hope he's not getting big on the whole trade unionism bandwagon and all that. Uh, I'm possible. I'm, I'm but, guessing it's, I'm guessing it's more like Konkin where it's, it's about entrepreneurs not, you know, working for a, a corporate bureaucracy. Yeah. But um, being so an entrepreneur I, yeah. is work though. But, but being an entrepreneur is work though. Let's be honest. So, uh, True, not quite but sure if it's a source of happiness and not misery, then it wouldn't apply to what he's saying here. Fair enough, which is why I'm making the assumption he's talking more about like the, the, the corporate, you know, government state thing or whatever. Um, and the next sentence, too, is interesting. Alienation is far more dangerous for us than toothless, outdated, dying ideologies. I can't tell you how many times my coworkers at all of my jobs keep talking about how much they feel alienated. It is fucking amazing. And apparently one of the reasons why they like talking to me is for whatever reason, and several of them have said this, even just by talking to me in a, you know, our very platonic way, um, they feel less alone. So I think Hakeem really hit on something really poignant there. Because if he's saying this back in 1991 and I have coworkers and, you know, in, in, in 2018 saying this kind of uh, – basically explaining how they feel so le feel less alone when I talk to them for all of like f less than five minutes in between other things, um, that's, that's a sign of the times, ain't it, in some sense? All right. So in that second uh, – I guess in that second uh, – uh, the second item in that list was, uh, was interesting. He says that at present it reflects more abstraction than actuality. Uh, zines and BBSs exchange information, which is part of the necessary groundwork of the TAS, but very little of this information relates to concrete goods and services necessary for the autonomous life. That has definitely advanced. Uh, you know, I think this, the, yeah. this, the, the folks of uh, the authors of uh, Second Round Book on Strategy, uh, you know, they talk about uh, the fact that, uh, you know, these TASs can now exist in cyberspace because the, the products and services do exist necessary for autonomous, for the autonomous life. And most of that is done, you know, via encryption, uh, digital currencies, things like the Deep Web, Open Bazaar, uh, that, that, that sort of thing. And then also more, more along the lines of like I2P and uh, IRC chats and things like that. Yeah, the, what he, he was definitely, I'm, I'm sure he was correct in, in the 1990s. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, where, where all senses are, senses are involved, yeah, all senses can be involved, right? Um, at least to to a certain extent. So uh, I think we have that now. I think we have that now, and uh, all it takes uh, at, at this point is freedom pioneers to help develop develop uh, these these places, uh, and also you know actual physical places too, not just cyberspace. Agreed. Agreed. Nothing else. All right. Uh, let me see if there's anything else uh, pertinent from this uh, this portion. Um, uh, nothing else except, uh, you know, he says, without the web, the full realization of the TAS complex would be impossible. I definitely agree, uh, at least to a certain extent. Uh, you, you did have those temporary autonomous zones without the Internet. So so that is true. Um, but with the advent of the Internet and blockchain and things like that, uh, you know, TAS should should become far more commonplace. Uh, so I think that's uh, something positive to look for in the, in the very near future. Uh, so this third, uh, this third, uh, uh, third item on the on his uh, list is uh, basically talking about, I guess, basically that uh, as power disappears, our will to power must be disappearing. So he's just talking about, uh, uh, I guess, kind of the need for uh, the, the need for Tazis, right? That's kind of how I see it. Well, but notice his, his emphasis on our will to power must be disappearance. Well, that sounds a lot like old man Rayo, right? And Vanu yeah. and all that. Yeah. Ooh. I don't know. Did Hakeem Bey read Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom? I don't know. Maybe I a little so. bit. I think so. Maybe. Yeah. They, they wrote know. the same publications. And I think, um, <laughs> I think if I remember correctly, that, uh, well, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty positive. Yeah. Pretty positive. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, I wouldn't either. I wouldn't either. So... So yeah, I guess that kind of concludes the uh, the, the the Taz portion. Do you have any uh, I guess any uh, closing thoughts for the listeners as as we wrap up this part one? I would simply say that temporary autonomous zones are much more practical than uh, you know political crusading and, and such. So just just to kind of you know repeat that one over again. I, I think that's pretty much just where it's at. You know, if you're serious about your freedom, liberty, and or Vanu, then I would seriously start start suggesting that you do whatever you can to basically exercise a temporary autonomous zone beginning with yourself. And um, I, I and keep in mind mobility too. And if there are threats, uh, if the bludgies and such, then then move to where your autonomous zone, uh, temporary as it is, can still be maintained. Again, that's why that's the temporary in temporary autonomous zones. Just to stress that one more time. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So I think, 
uh, depending upon the length of the pass portion, which we should be able to get an hour out of it uh, easy, uh, you know, I think we might as well just go ahead and split these into two episodes. What do you think? I, I think we might have to uh, because yeah, it's about uh, an hour and a half in already, and we haven't even touched the passes. <laughs> uh oh, uh oh. I, I guess this is an impromptu part two. Oh, uh oh, I've been talking too long again. How about that, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what we've all come to to know and love, Kyle. So don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Oh, uh, so. shucks. <laughs> all right. So. Uh, so yeah, what we'll do is we'll, we'll close this out for now, and uh, we will return next week for the uh, for the Paz portion. If you take a look at the world around you, the outlook for personal freedom can appear quite grim. The size and scope of government continues to increase, regardless of the endless promises by political rulers to rein it in. The government robs you of more and more of your income every single day and there appears to be no end to their thievery in sight. The revelations by Edward Snowden and other leaks paint a picture of an omnipotent, all-seeing government. Privacy is definitely a thing of the past. With all of these obstacles and others to overcome, freedom may really seem dead. But it's not. Back in the 1960s, a freedom pioneer by the name of Rayo developed a strategy known as Vanu, which is premised around the invulnerability to coercion, whether public, government, or private criminals. It was largely forgotten until early 2017 when Shane and Kyle launched the Vanu Podcast, a podcast discussing all things Vanu. If you're an individual looking for practical solutions in regaining your personal freedom, then the Vanu Podcast is the podcast for you. Subjects discussed include the philosophy behind Vanu, survivalism, financial independence, crypto anarchism, country shopping, and much, much more. Find the website at vanupodcast.com. That is Victor, Oscar, November, Uniform, Podcast.com. And make sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher. Again, that is vanupodcast.com. The outlook for personal freedom has never looked better. <laughs>